Dr. Jeremy Weiss here. I'm founder of InspiredInsider.com where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. Today we have Lori Haller. She's one of the top direct response designers. She's been doing it for over 25 years. She is the secret weapon used to help top copywriters beat controls and produce winning copy. And that's why I'm especially excited to talk to you. Some of her well-known clients have included Forbes, K Jewelers, National Geographic. She's worked on one of Oprah's books, which we will talk about. She's worked with top direct response clients such as Agora Publishing, Boardroom Inc., Gary Benzavenga, only to name a few. And she's also on the AWAI Board of Directors as the graphic design art guru. Lori, thank you for joining me. Jeremy, it's my pleasure to be here with you today. Hi. I'm very excited to talk to you and you know, to hear your big lessons, what you what works, what doesn't work. And Roy Fur recommended, highly recommends you among other people. And I always like to start off with a fun fact. Before we get into the exciting design creatives that you've used to help produce this winning copy, you have a, a especially fun fact. You yeah. choose a daily song of the day. Tell me about that. How did that start? What do you do with that? Yes, I call it an SOTD. It's the song of the day. And the way I use it to help myself in the studio and others around me is to pick a song that kind of denotes the theme of the day or the feeling. In my art studio, it can be really fast and furious, up all night and deadlines again, or it can be a methodical day of research. So as I sent you a song one day, it was like Jane's Addiction, uh, right. Jane Says from Nothing Shocking album. Um, I will pick that one day and then perhaps the next day I'll need to kick it down a notch to Beethoven because I need to be calm and still. So I think it's kind of fun and now, you know, a lot of my friends and I share these and even videos and uh, poems and YouTube stuff. videos. Yeah. Yes. So what's one where you had to work fast and furious the whole night? What was one that sticks out that got you through one of those creative design nights? Yes, um, it was actually seven days, uh, Jeremy. It was a rush deadline for Roger Conrad's utility forecaster. And it was Dick Sanders at the helm for copy under the direction of Vicki Moffat. And normally these things take three or four weeks. We had seven days. So I, why was it so short? Why was the time frame so short? <laughs> yeah, I always ask myself that question, you know, but that's neither here nor there. But um, so Moby had just come out with his album Play, and I have, you know, a sound system in the studio. I put that just on winding again and again, complete rewind, and uh, for seven days straight, day and night, day and night, you know, hardly any sleep or eating. But, um, I can still hear all those songs and I could probably recite the order of them. But in the end, Dick Sanders and I pulled it through and it was the longest and biggest win for Retirement Watch, or excuse me, for Utility Forecaster, uh, Roger Conrad, of course, in the 18 year history of wow. the newsletter. So uh, definitely, if I ever got a chance to meet Moby, I would thank him. <laughs> but so it does help. Oh, yeah. And I'm sure everyone has their different methods. Some people like to sit in silence and you like to just jam, have a jam session. Um, and you also mentioned um, a huge yoga ball. What do you do with that? Yes, I have this huge BBB, what I call my big beloved black yoga ball. And I just, I'll, I do a lot of yoga and Pilates and meditation. And I will just make myself get up because, you know, a lot of times we're like this, you know, in our chair while yeah. we're working. And you have to just get up and walk around. And I just lay over it, you know, on my back and just just make myself go upside down for a while and shake everything around in my head. Yes. So it helps me. I don't know. Um, perhaps it will help somebody else. It definitely does. You know, getting up and about. So tell me about, I want to hear about Oprah's book. How did that work? Yes. Oprah's book, it was amazing. Just sitting here one day, you know, researching or designing, and Carlene Anglai Cole gives me a call. We do a lot of projects together. Profound A-list writer, as you know. 
And uh, she starts talking, and you've probably heard this story, but she's like, Lori, I have to tell you. And then there's just like screaming on the end of the phone. And what did it sound like? It was, ah, 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 Oprah, ah, ah, you know, on and on for quite a long time. So I wasn't sure, you know, something bad had happened. But <laughs> finally, after uh, her and I are very high energy, I don't know if you've had the opportunity. Um, she's so No, I haven't. She would, yeah. Yes, you must. Be. I will have to. What's but, her, what's her name? Carlene Anglais Cole, okay. and she is like I mentioned an A-list, top top copywriter, great to work with, high energy. She does her research, and so they had called her from Time Life, I believe it was at that point, and contracted her to do the project and write the copy, and they said that you know she could choose any designer she wanted and I just um, first of all you know just touched me so much that she asked me and obviously we were a very good fit it did very well together you know in the mail as a as a test package and um, just that whole process of working with Oprah and her team obviously you know Oprah didn't come to my studio and sit down in my chair over here or anything but she had, you know, Gail King and I think it was like a team of three people, the liaisons between Carlene and I. And um, they sent us thousands, maybe maybe three to five thousand, I would say, shots of Oprah. Wow. Me too. Holy but, cow. Yeah, like on a big machine in uh, the postal or UPS, something like that. What's typical? You know, that's 3000 What would a uh, typical client, I don't know if there's any typical, but an average be? A Gosh, sometimes I have to beg, borrow, and steal and make my own doctor sometimes when I'm working with them. They don't have any good shots. Mm -hmm. And obviously, this is Oprah. And there were a lot of other, you know, shots that I was looking at. Yeah. Her with Gail King, just Gail King, but different outfits and faces. And we didn't know yet which exact headline we were going to go with. Mm -hmm. So when we chose the big surprise, I kind of needed her face to look like that and tie in the copy. Um, and so that was lovely that they shared those. We didn't have to do a photo shoot, but I was secretly hoping, gosh, Lori, maybe you could come up with something. <laughs> I need Oprah on an elephant yeah. with a zebra. Yeah. And then I'm like, I have to photo direct that and you need to fly me yeah. out. So like 3,000 photos or was it one we found? We need to do a separate <laughs> shoot. I'm sorry. Yes, that's exactly right. But working with them was lovely. It was a little tight deadline. But, you know, Carlene's copy was just precise, pristine, perfect. And uh, the team was great to work with. And, and it was just, it was great experience. And I will say this, that um, that made such a difference in my career. And I really cannot thank Carlene ever enough for considering me for that. So tell me about this. With the, what was that picture for? Was it the book? Was it uh, something you were sending out? Yes. What had happened was this was Oprah's third book, mm -hmm. and she needed a way to promote it. And they had used some promotions in the past, the way I understand it. Uh, since I wasn't the first in line direct liaison person, you know, I hear from emails and whatnot, but. We needed to promote that book, so they hired Carlene to write the copy for a direct mail campaign. Uh, some of the winners were a little larger than a digest. Say we're talking about six or seven by nine, maybe 24, 32 pages. Wow. And it was going to be mailed, you know, worldwide. And uh, how would we together sell this book by showing the book? having a little short sheet uh, letter in the beginning. The first couple of pages were very short. Uh, so you could see those and then see the design behind. So Gail was speaking and then tell about all the benefits and uh, beautiful photos and some of the celebrities that were going to be portrayed in this book was a compilation of some of the past magazines. In the Which book was it? What was it called? Do you remember? Big beautiful book of Oprah, I believe. This was many years ago. Yeah, I know. <laughs> so what was, do you remember what some of the winning headlines, what you ended up going with? 
with the because you end up saying you said with the surprise, so you had to choose a photo yes. around the. I cannot remember all of those headlines, but I remember the one with the words that contained surprise, mm -hmm. and then just this photo I found of her kind of leaning in, and the reds and the colors it it, it matched up. And with what I do as a graphic designer is uh, I try to tie in that feeling what the copywriter has created for the words and find a matching visual mm -hmm. pull it all together and this red and the purples they were party colors I knew they would excite people when it came in the mail and then the way I splashed those colors on the inside together with Carlene obviously um, made it exciting like you cannot wait to get this book you have to have it Come on. Right. so go back a little bit so how did you and Carlene start working together Carlene and I were matched together a couple times in the business, and we had a very good rapport right at the start. Uh, I don't know if it's because we were women or our energy level. I kind of talked about that a little bit. She's very high energy, and so am I, and we're both very passionate about what we do. So I think the mixture of that, it's kind of like cooking. You know, it's definitely tasty, and uh, we are a good mix. So... After a while working together, I wanted to meet with her and a couple other women once in, once in a while, once a month if I could, just to get out of the studio. Uh, we're all mothers, Carlene and I, Kim Krause Schwamm, another A-list top copywriter. Luckily, she lives, you know, 10 minutes away. I need more women copywriters. Yes. I don't have enough women copywriters. Oh, I know. A slew of them. Yeah excellent women copywriters. I'm going to have to tell you about them. Uh, so we decided to meet maybe once a month, twice a month at the local Starbucks and just sit and talk about business. Somebody would come up with something that they were having a problem with, perhaps a client uh, managing a million children and launching their business. So right. here we all have our own companies. Maybe we're starting another company. We have a bunch of kids. Uh, I think at one point we had someone was expecting, someone brought their infant, they were nursing, you know, all of us with pieces of paper. And yeah. uh, I really, I attribute Carlene picking and choosing me, perhaps, because she got to know me and the real me and what I stand for at those coffees. Now, I have asked her this question point blank. Mm -hmm. What'd you ask her? Recently, yes. When I was at the recent Clayton Make Peace uh, event, Carlene and I were both there speaking along with others, and it gave me some time alone with her just to ask her, you know, hindsight six years or so later, like, why did you pick me? Was everyone else busy and on vacation? <laughs> <laughs> was it because we both have curly hair, you know? And, um, you know, I asked her about those coffee shop meetings and, um, you know, she just said because we connected and just because I guess I'm so passionate as well. But I do want to recommend trying to reach out to each other. I really think that did give me an edge. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes it's hard to just meet each other on the Internet mm -hmm. and email. Um, people will tell you. I go outside the box to meet them because I want to feel that energy. Mm -hmm. And uh, sometimes that blasts your productivity together. I know Kim Schwamm and I, we worked together very successfully for about five years. And then something came up where I'm like, God, I wish I could just sit down with you. I want to sketch this logo and how I'm going to put these visuals here. And I'm like, I live in you know, Maryland. Wait, where do you? live Kim and she's like I live in Maryland and I'm like well I live you know near Bethesda in Germantown area and um, she said you know she did as well so I just asked her if we could meet and we found out we were about 10 minutes away which was excellent and ever since then we'll meet and I'll bring a sketch pad and I'll even go over to her studio at night or go on a conference call client from her studio and uh, you know we've nailed a million clients together that way but the main 
point I wanted to make, Jeremy, is that, you know, connecting with each other as a writer or artist, it's almost like a, a good marriage, you know, not a bad marriage, but a good one, where you're so connected, you're so into each other, and um, you can really get the huge, long-running winners that way because you're focused and you're on track together. Yeah. What were some of the things that people said about balance? Like you mentioned, you know, the real world is you have kids, you have other stuff, and you have a career, um, and you're starting your business. How? What were some of the things that came um, with those conversations? How did people? How did you and and the other people in the group balance having kids and and your career? Yes, let's see. That is a good question. Um, I think it was a lot of will and stamina and not much sleep. Um, it was very difficult, but I think together, having each other together um, gave you strength. You could call on the other person at any time. You knew you could if you had to. And just hearing their stories, like they were at the same place. Carlene has four children. Uh, the other woman had two, you know, the other one I, I believe had four as well. It, it, you know, I only have three boys, so I That's a lot. That I, but I think that um, it gave you some balance and we knew we could make it and now, you know, as you thrust forward and you stay on track with your goals, um, you know, it was well worth it and this was such a huge desire and passion of mine to create art in my own studio for people um, that I'm just very excited that it's worked out so well. I'm very, very blessed and pretty much not a day goes by that many times I don't say that out loud. Yeah. What about, so that's an amazing project with Oprah, but you also worked with Richard Simmons and Gary Benzaving on a project. So tell me <laughs> about how that worked. Yes, that was another one of those uh, where you just you know, want to pinch yourself. So Gary Bensvinga and Vicki Moffitt through another company had this client or account, Richard Simmons, and it was to sell and promote his newsletter in a successful way to gain access to more subscribers. So they took a trip out to meet with him personally. I didn't get to go on that trip, but I wanted to. Um, evidently, from what they say, you know, throughout the years, he is just as lovely as you would imagine and just a kind, giving, wonderful person. I, I would love one day to meet him, but so Gary Vincevingo, which uh, I, I just have to tell you this, every time I worked with Gary, I'm like shaking and shuddering, you know, it's Gary Vincevingo for crying out loud. And, it takes me a while to pull myself together and just say, Lori, you need to settle down. <laughs> uh, just listen and hear, you know, what he has to say. And Gary is, as you know, if you know him, he's so not like that. He's so open and kind and sharing and giving and just, it, he makes you feel like a million bucks. Yeah, the whole time. And you know you're not. But so he wrote this wonderful copy and he's like, let's do the package for Richard Simmons newsletter, huge. Let's do it a large size, you know. So we came out with this number 14 outer carrier, you know, it's like this in the mail, which is very expensive. Enormous tabloid letter, maybe like eight page, 16 page letter. So the people would wow. really hold it up and read it. I wish I had one. Um, he specifically gave me like the data. Listen, Lori, we're, let's try it in Courier. Let's try it in just this regular font so it looks like typewriter. I hope it's okay that I'm saying all this. I guess it's been a min many years, so uh, I guess it's okay. Is it a but, trade uh, secret? Yeah, big big secret here. <laughs> so let's let's go ahead and run that letter on the inside columns of these huge pages and then he and Vicky found these before and after shots of people you know who had been successful here I am at this weight you right. know, not feeling good here I am thin and feeling energetic again and again and again they had found them and they were hideous shots you know they're black and white some were color and the designer and me at first I was like 
I can't use these. You know, her hair. What was hideous about it? Yes, in the sense when I say hideous about these photos, normally, you know, you and I and the public want to see this perfect, lavish shot. You know, it's perfect, beautiful background. And this is Gary. Gary sees this. Lori, no, that's not the kind of shot you need. These need to be real shots. They have to have an ugly background. Like someone taking a picture in the garage or something. That's exactly what these shots were. Now, yeah. I didn't know that yet. Gary, you know, knows, Gary knows all. Gary knew that these people would open up these enormous letters because they would land in their mailbox like this instead of like this. They would open them up and they would read his wonderful copy, but they would see these before and after shots and somebody's kid would be in the background you know going like this while they were taking their photo and it would be a horrible outfit and they didn't look good in it and <laughs> it was killing me but finally you know i caught on and it it, it just was uh, beautiful and ugly all at the same time i i just i learned so much from gary every time then at the end of the letter you know i'm you know, it's signed off by Richard Simmons or whoever, you know, publication manager Gary used. And then I remember Gary gets back to me with edits and he's, you know, says, let's try making the PS like really big. And of course, you know, I forget it's Gary. And I'm like, that's like the stupidest idea of ever. <laughs> Nobody's going to do that. Did you say out loud or were you just thinking that? Oh, I I would only think that. You okay. know, put it together in you know, in my in the back of my head, but I'm thinking I've never done this and what's this all about? And of course I do it and it looks great and uh it won like hot cakes forever as usual and we knew that already. But just getting all this insight, he maps out things in court first. He when we did the Rosen Garden report that won so well, again, it was a magalog. It looked like this beautiful, slick piece, all these gorgeous photos. There was almost nothing for me to do but fix it up, just a hair here and there, because he had so eloquently designed and gathered the right photos and whatnot to go to copy. So just amazing. I, I, I cannot believe that was me. That got to work on all these projects still to this day. So yeah. the Richard Simmons one, what what did you actually have to do? Were you just like, did you have to lay things out? I'm just trying to understand how it works, I guess. Yes, exactly. I would lay things out. I would set up the document and use his comments, just like any creative director. Say he was in the position of the creative director, perhaps. And he would give me some insight, but that's the other thing about Gary. He knows how it should look or whatever, but instead of, you know, you know, do this, do that, he just makes it feel like it's your idea too, that you're a team. He allows you, even though it was, it's just me, I got that chance. And that chance of working with him and others in my career early on skyrocketed it so I could have my own company and, you know, have the blessings that I have today. I'm trying to think, Lori, so what worked with that when you were laying things out? I'm trying to picture it. Like, do you only include two pictures on a page or four pictures or how, how, what? I guess, could you describe like how that looked and how you actually laid it out so I can understand, kind of get inside your head? Yes, exactly. So at first, I, I probably tried a variety of looks. So say the page is this big. Yeah, you have a lot of room there to work with. I used the type enormous. So it was so easy to read. Instead of 12-point type, for example, I think I went to 16 maybe at the beginning. Sometimes on first pages, what we try to do is uh, put very large type to draw the reader in and make it very easy to see that copy. So I laid it out uh, to show Gary, I think I had some purple bands. We were using this lilac purple uh, color theme to brand Richard. We came up with our brand look and we're driving it home together. Then juxtapositioning these twisted kind of angled black and white photos, right. put like a border around them, 
just lay them on the page so they're telling the story with little captions and feeding it to the reader page by page until we come to the crescendo. So, you know, by that time they trust us and they've read Gary's copy and they're getting their wallets out. Mm -hmm. So do you, what's your process for that? Do you have it on a page and you're like laying photos out or how does that work? When I actually do the design yeah. and, um, I feel like I couldn't visualize that without having it in front of me. And so obviously you're a designer, so you could probably visualize it without doing all that. I'm just curious of what your process is. Well, I wish you could see my studio on a regular day. I um, cleaned it up a little bit before I invited you in. <laughs> but, for example, when I'm working on a piece such as that, I would just tear out all kinds of ideas. I do tons of research in the beginning. Okay, so this would be a snapshot of what's in my mind doing it for Richard Simmons, and I'm selling it to people in this age group, maybe 40s to 80s. I want them to want this newsletter. What are other newsletters looking like? What does our newsletter look like? Mm -hmm. So I would sketch, even though now I have these big fancy computers, I still sketch. I still tear out things. My walls will be covered and covered with bits and pieces, and now with my phone, you know, my cell phone, I sit and just photograph. I go around everywhere to libraries, places that I feel will be these kind of people I'm talking to, photograph it and look at them again and again and again like that. And then I will go into my computer and lay it out and try to just be fluid. That's where that song of the day comes in. Now, I didn't really have that a lot when I was working with Gary on that particular project, but I kind of had to set the tone myself for that feeling back and forth with him. And each copywriter is different. Each project is different. Right. So for me, the artist, I don't know how the copywriter gets into that group, but for me, the artist, that cadence back and forth is so critical that... Uh, like working with Gary, I want to set that tone. So that does that give you a good? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm asking this just because I'm trying to picture it. Not everyone has a different process, but I'm I'm wondering what you do for your process because I may be able to use that, you know, with whatever I'm doing as well, because um, exactly. it obviously works. Um, and, and about that, Lori, can you run through the process so people know what's happening before you? receive the information, then what you're doing then after. How does that process work? Because really, the, the people I've interviewed, and I'm so glad Roy suggested this, I'm just hearing from the copywriter's perspective, and then they'll say, oh, I handed it to the designer, but I know nothing of what happens after that, because you have to make it, you know, actually make it appealing so people are going to read it also. So I'm wondering what that process looks like. Right. Well, that is a good question. I guess with that in mind, I'll start out with this little like snapshot of how I feel about copy and how I feel about design. So in my heart, I don't know if you agree with this, but it's how I feel. Copy is king, and then design is the queen, and together they rule their whole kingdom with power and strength. And together, they make this direct mail campaign or brochure or whatever it is they're working on together, this king and queen, it's hand in hand. So this can't be without this, and the queen cannot be without her king. And it's beautiful, and you, if you think about it in this way, I think it will give you some insight on how critical it is for clients to know this and, like, pair us together, that's where the big winners come, where you have that. Yeah. that what should copywriters know about working with designers? Yeah. Gosh, you have like 15 days. <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, working with designers, it's, I, I think, the key. This, I'll just tell you my key idea is yeah. just 
working together so closely. So in the beginning, maybe I can paint that picture for you, Jeremy, Jeremy how it happens together with yeah. us. Um, when, the, when the client calls us, yeah. sometimes they'll call me and say, we're getting ready to do this new package, Lori. Who would you like to write it? Sometimes they call them, you know, so-and-so, I'm going to go ahead and have you write the copy. Have you ever worked with a designer that you might, you know, feel is a good fit? So it depends on how that all happens and who it is. So for me, on my end, as they're writing it or before they write it, sometimes we have kickoff meetings before anything's done. And we talk about the brand, the positioning, Mm -hmm. the problem, the need. And I'm right there in that listening and hearing. Uh, sometimes the writer's already written the copy and submitted it. It depends. And then they send it to me, and then I ask for a kickoff call. Normally, before that kickoff call, I will ask for, um, and Roy has said this to me recently uh, because we did a campaign together. You know, I probably asked too many questions, I'm thinking, but um, it's really critical. So I asked for winners, all the winners and why, and when they mailed, this for a direct mail campaign specifically, I asked for losers. When it mailed, you know, why they think it was a loser, Mm -hmm. and I tear both of those pieces apart. How many pages was it? How big was the font? Let me look at the copy. I don't just read the copy a million times. I look at the design, the offer, how it was fed to them, how fast, how slow, the photos, everything. Mm. You know, other really break it all down. Really minutia, like I'm. uh, I call myself Columbo. Yes. You know, I like, and then I like, and one more thing. (laughs) Give me, uh, can you give me that thing you ran in '85 that um that really works? So I ask for a big pack of things. I want to know, because if I were just to sit here in my studio, imagine this, you know, looking at a, a, a big, lovely chunk of copy and just say, you know, what do I feel like today? I don't know. I'm feeling kind of green and brown. Well, without going back in history, here's right. the last 10 years. Yeah. This is what's been done successfully and non-successfully. Yeah. You know. Um, Very smart. Yeah. Does that uh, help at all? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. That helps a tremendous amount, and and I know we'll be talking a little bit about some of the things that worked, and some of the things what that didn't work, um, and you'll be able to speak. You could probably speak for days on that because you probably every campaign you're looking through a million things that worked and ones that didn't work, and breaking that down, which are are interesting to hear. Um, and so when you're done. With your, they often give. Do they have the copy written ahead of time, and then they give it to you, and you have to work your magic on it, or do sometimes they want ideas from you first before writing the copy? Yes, it goes both ways. It, it works both ways. Sometimes there's a huge nut to crack, and we can't figure out why something has been suppressed. It's fatigued so badly, and it's too late, and we really need to get some money in the door. We will together come up with, um, we'll look at all the results, all the paperwork, why, who, who's on the mailing list, and uh, try to figure that out. Mm -hmm. But yes, pretend uh, it comes to me, so then that's when we would start that deep core relationship. I start, and I don't know if all designers do this, but I would hope so, I read the copy at least twice first. Once just so I get an idea, and then the second time I kind of do the yellow highlighter and write some notes and stuff like that, then I really start reading it. And I might have told you this already, but I try to become the person the copywriter has written this for. Instead of me being Lori, I become that, you know, 63-year-old man with a bad prostate, for example. (laughs) That's the tough reason to... I say that is because the last five packages have come in a clump, and I've been working on these really cool prostate packages. I have a lot of winners, and I've been trying to beat you know the controls I have. But at one point with a female copywriter, I'm like, I need to grow me a prostate. <laughs> I need one. I don't know what this is all about. <laughs> but 
But you have to connect, whether it's a memory product, whether it's a books, yeah. a exercise or massage program or something that you're trying to sell. Yeah. You have to become that person yeah. the copywriter is writing to. Yeah. I think that's a really important point that anyone, whatever they're doing, needs to get inside the mind of their customer to give them what they want. So that's so. How do you do that with a 63-year-old man who has a prostate? How do you? What is your method to get inside the become that that customer? That is a good question. I will try to find little focus groups of women or men or whoever fit that little segment. Mm -hmm. I have called maybe five or six of my closest friends and told them I need to talk about, you know, a women's product for this or that. Uh, maybe fatigue. I will tell them, you know, can everybody meet me for lunch and just talk about some of the points in the copy. Do you experience this? Is that going to make me rewrite the copy? No, you know, I'm not the copywriter, although I do write and help with a lot of the yeah. copy at some point at this level that I'm at. But it does give me that insight. I need to feel them, become them, because the last thing I want to happen or can have happen is for this piece to come in their mailbox and it totally not hit home right. at all. And, yeah. and so if you design for what you like or, you know, I have, this is very unfortunate. I've had clients come to me and they've hired me, you know, professional and a copywriter. They have asked for our opinion and our consultation. And then we do all this and then they come in and they're like, I was showing this to my wife last night. And, you know, no offense. She doesn't like purple, you know. She, so we're going to change it to blue and red. She likes red. You know, Marsha likes red. And so, great, go ahead, you know, what, what am I going to say? I will arm wrestle him to the floor and give it my shot and try to talk with him about my research and why and why did he hire us. But you cannot make somebody do something in life, as you know. Yeah. So, um, so sometimes that happens, you know, where it goes down the wrong way. So I have to become this person. Yeah, that's a good because oftentimes, you know, the person we're asking their advice may not be that customer. So they're just giving their opinion based off of them and not off of who's actually going to get the product or the service. Right. So I like that one. Um, so I want to talk a little bit, Lori, about your inspiration from early on. Where where did you grow up? What was some of the inspiration influences um, you know, from your childhood? Okay. Yeah, it's hard to say where I grew up. I was born in Bethesda at the Naval Hospital, and then we traveled around a lot because my father was in the military. Um, I, I spent a lot of time with my grandparents for many reasons on their farm in Leon, Iowa. Oh. Yeah, so that was fun, 380 acres of land. Did they put you to work on the farm? Definitely. Lots of cows, lots of milking pigs and gathering of the eggs and uh, I actually have a, a table that was it's in my studio and it's so dear to my heart it's the milk table that my mom and my grandma and I would sit at to separate the milk and the cream really and anybody that comes in I'm sure they're like gosh why do you have that old beat up you know gate leg table that's falling apart in your studio and they just don't realize, like my great grandmother, my grandmother, and oh. my mother and I, all sat at that table and separated the milk, and uh, it means so much to me. So it's like having my whole family right here. Oh wow! So that was kind of fun, and then just uh, it's a family heirloom. Yeah, yeah. I'll let I'll let you see it sometime, and you might change your wording. <laughs> we'll call it antique. <laughs> antique yeah. family heirloom. That's always helpful to use. That Not word. a broken down table. So it's, uh, you know, that kind of a background where uh, my grandparents were very loving and kind and uh, gave so much time to me. And, uh, you know, I spent a lot of time reading and sketching out in the country, driving a tractor. Hmm. And that's kind of when my passion for writing, like, letters, making letters when I learned to write, I would create letter forms. And that's probably where my bubble of 
you know, design and energy came from. I knew then I loved art and it pacifies me and it's my passion. So it just rolled into the whole rest of my life and you know, now I have my own studio. Was someone else in your life into art or did you just kind of see things that way? Yes, I think it was probably a combination of both. Um, my grandma tells me that I was very hyperactive or high energy. I right. know you're, you're like, wait, really? I can't believe that. So I think the story goes, they used to just give me tons of pads of paper and markers and crayons. And ah, what. I see, yeah. Yeah. So I don't know if that was fed to me and I mm -hmm. used that and it made me feel so good. But I do... Yeah. I don't know if you do this because I can't see inside your mind, but for me, when I talk to people or hear things, I see like visuals and images come up. So right, for, example, for sure. Yeah, if you're the client or the writer and you're telling me about an idea, the whole time my design brain or the way my brain works is I for sure, for sure do that. And I picture, have you ever seen the movie, uh, the Temple Grandin movie? No. Oh, Temple Grandin basically, and they showed her like how she thought and basically just all these visual pictures just flying through. Um, but she, had, uh, I believe, was autistic and just created these, you know, um, groundbreaking ways that um, to to have the cattle go to get slaughtered so it would be they'd have a better experience than what they were having so but it's exactly what you're describing I immediately picture picture those things but yes yes so that can be a good thing when you use it for good and when you use it for design and art mm -hmm. but it's something that you have to control because it's constant and it's thinning for me so I have to control it and stay focused and I'm learning as I get older and through you know people that are helping me out to use it and focus it into my design and stuff and not let it you know get out of control too much and that's really I think catapulted my my visual skills. Yeah. So how then how did you get started in designing for direct response? I took a job uh, in Washington, D.C. I took many jobs. I followed people around. I read about them, top designers really? like. Yes, I would scope out who's designing what in some of the award ceremonies. Like I what? Their name. Larry Rosengren was working at this one company. There was Abramson and Associates, and it was uh, Terry Coveney, and Debbie Piccolino, and Victoria Valentine, I would, I would see these names and see who was doing these pieces and I would try to follow them or get a job or freelance under their wing as a wow, creative that's director. really smart. Well, so how did, what were they, what did they, some of the things they produced that you saw and thought, wow, I want to work with these people? Yeah, they would be like direct mail campaigns or brochures or back then in the 80s, Annual reports were very huge and juicy and lavish. Mm -hmm. And um, with Larry Rosengren, I saw that at Windsor Domain, where he was, that they had the Black Star and Frost account. They had K Jewelers, um, Cadillac, a variety of that level. That's what I wanted to feel and experience. Yeah, yeah. And Larry, just like you know, Gary Bentavinga, he was so kind and giving with his knowledge. He would come into my, you know, room and say, uh, one of my favorite things was, if some of the letters were too far apart, he would say, Lori, I could drive a truck right between those letters <laughs> too far apart, you know, things such as that. But just like he Gary. He said it in a real nice way. Yeah. yeah. Well, maybe not. <laughs> um you know, they were giving and they wanted to give to me and help me learn. And they knew, you know, I didn't know. And instead of making me feel bad about what I didn't know, they were kind enough to give back. And they probably felt that, like, 
give me, give me, give me thing. I really wanted it. And right. I was really willing to work hard and late hours and put my all into it. It wasn't a job for me. You know, it's my passion. So I would watch uh, Larry and I would watch him sketch. Back then, we didn't have computers. You know, you would sketch out and trace the letters and create the comps, the comprehensive, the presentation to show the client. And for Black Star and Cross or K Jewelers, I'll never forget, we had this uh, line of men's rings. They were very expensive rings. And these guards, armed police officers or guards, would have to bring the hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of materials in each day and check us in and stuff. And so they wanted a campaign to spotlight these rings. And... Um, Luckily, Larry gave me a chance, and they had like this cowboy western player. Don't forget, this was a million years ago, so I'm trying to remember, but I feel it You're still. doing a good job, yeah. So I positioned these, but we didn't have the photography like we do at our you know, fingertips with my little you know, phone. I sketched out this pristine silver like chrome barbed wire. And on this bar wire were these like watches, and I think it was a combination of watches and men's prolific rings, this new design. And Leo you know, Larry went crazy over it. It's probably from my, you know, I just thought of that. It's probably from that, you know, cow pastor background I had. Right, I'm like, right. let's see, Western cowboys. So, you know, he guided me, and that's you know, from that project to the next one, and then I moved on to another company. Finally, I hit into Joe Schramm and Associates, and he did tons of direct mail at his company. He was so kind to give me the position of kind of like his creative director, art director, and the accounts he had, such as Hyatt, Georgetown Hotel, Fosse, which was Federal Office Systems Expo, on that level, again, I learned from Joe, who uh, just recently passed away. Oh, sorry to hear that. So very much. Again, somebody giving, giving, yeah. giving. So what did he teach you with some of the campaigns? Yeah, for the direct mail, that, that was the seriousness. Um, that was probably the core for me. I didn't really understand so totally how the effect of the art and the copy could then bring in so much money. You know, I was just... I was doing to make it work, but he really spelled it out for me. And he would do this thing where I would go into his office and I would present to he and sometimes he and his wife. And then uh, I'll tell you this, and then you know he would either take his socks off or not. <laughs> so that was our little thing. If he did, if he didn't take his socks off, I didn't knock his socks off. It wasn't good. It wasn't good enough. He, he would really, literally take his socks off. I'm not like at least one. And, and I knew. So was that good if he took his socks off or not Definitely. good? Definitely. If, if I knocked his socks off, we could knock the people's socks off in the big, huge presentation in a couple of weeks. So he would try to, you know, tell me some stuff again, like Gary and Larry and everybody else, you know, guide me and give me some direction so I could use that power and then think about it and visually pull the copy and the, and the design together. Right. So we had this account, like I mentioned, uh, Federal Office Systems Expo. It was an expo for companies to come and see some of the new things and the federal government and such as that. So it was, uh, I would say, maybe 200 exhibitors. It's really hard to remember. I apologize. But in any no, case, yeah. um, the main thrust of this story is that. Joe uh, hired George Plimpton to be our spokesperson. And really, George Plimpton, you know, come on. So we did radio. Uh, we, we did the radio and TV recording in Spicer Productions in Baltimore every year. And then had photography and used George Plimpton. And it really, I saw, that's the first time I saw, here's the attendee number. Say it was set 56,000. On this year catapulted in a few years to 200,000 wow you know by the proper use of copy yeah. positioning 
obviously George Plimpton. It was a perfect match for, again, getting back to that, uh, here's this core group of people. Um, at, at that point, I wasn't into the part of doing so much research and understanding the people, but I'm sure this is what Joe did, and I watched him do it. Then choosing George Plimpton, his, you know, suit, his look, you know, his, his accent, and he drove it home, and those people wanted to come. Yeah. Definitely. Brilliant. So the, you also um, wrote down about launching the Grand Hyatt. Mm, yeah. Without the hotel being built. That was tricky. What that happened with that? When Joe told me, you know, that we had the accounts, he had all the accounts with the Hyatts at that time. Um, you know, we're going to do this one, but it's not built yet. But we really, you know, the goal of these people is to, within three you know, years, have it already booked up before the hotel is open, I believe. This is the way I remember them giving me the data on sheets. Uh, this was our goal, that we needed to get it booked um, and figure out a way to develop some ads in magazines and for the Washington Post without having a hotel to look at. Yeah. So I was, I was like, wow, that's a puzzle to <laughs> So what do you no. do? What do you you do? go from Oprah, there's three to 5,000 pictures, and then here there's nothing. Yes, this was a long time ago, you know? So one neat thing that happened is uh, somebody had told me or brought into the office, I forget, this beautiful like 3D, I guess it was the architect's rendering in 3D of like the facade of what the Grand Height was going to look like. Yeah. And somebody had lit it, or we found a light for it. And I was looking at it, and it I could almost imagine the hotel. So then I believe somebody brought in some of the floor plans. We needed to see, how, you know, in 3D, how's this going to work? I needed to be able to show it. So I hired a photographer to come in, and we lit it and did a million different shots and got this one little long, thin photo, you know, not this big, you know, like if, if the hotel was really there, I would hire the best photographer, and I would have it shot with the perfect people coming out of the door and set the tone, you know. Right. I had nothing. So I used this slice down the left, and I used the branding logo and a little bit of light copy, just very open copy to say, you know, the elegance and it's coming and this and that, uh, groundbreaking, and tried to fake it for a while and, um, you know, luckily it worked really well. I used that photo on direct mail campaigns, uh, in ads and whatnot, uh, but that was tricky. I, I was going to mention that, so we couldn't show the interior part of the hotel either. Right. I can't tell them about those three restaurants, you know, like show them, I can tell them, I can't show them that beautiful you know, walnut counter or the huge steaks they're going to get. So I developed this campaign myself. This is some of my first copywriting was probably with Joe Schramm. And I pitched to the client to let me do three full-page ads or four in the Washington Post to announce the Grand Hyatt. And I, we took out these ads, and they were consecutive right-hand pages. Boom, boom, boom. So I led with a question, and I made them like secretive questions that talked about the benefits. So there's this, you know, 30 million gallon lagoon that was running through the whole hotel. There was this restaurant with beef in humongous proportions, like you have never seen aged reserve beef before. There was, you know, these unique specificities, you know, like Brian Kurtz talks about. He says, you know, and all the other copywriters that we work with, uh, what, is, what is the benefit? So I asked, how many gallons of water does it take to fill a whatever, you know, running lagoon? Then the next, you know, the branding logo, the dates that it was launching, small and subliminal, tasty and elegant, and then you would turn the page. How many pounds of reserved aged beef? Like that. So right. that... It, seemed, it got people turning the pages. It really did. I'm sure it was quite 
expensive, but you know, they didn't stop it or nobody told me to right. come up right now, so I don't know. Uh, again, back then things were different. You didn't get the report weekly that shows how your ads are running, or I didn't. And so, um, again, just somebody giving me a chance, and uh, it was really fun. I so when do you branch out, Lori, on your own? That was about 15 years ago. I um, really wanted to try to skyrocket and open up what I could do. I wanted to do uh, package design, which I'm very fond of, uh, larger direct mail campaigns, and just really be able to get in there. I'm a people person. I love meeting people and getting to know them and helping them. I really wanted to be the one to you know, get closer to the, be the front. front person and yeah, and make a bigger impact. Yeah. Um, it's not that I didn't. I loved what I was doing. Yeah. I was a wonderful company, yeah. uh, KCI Communications. Uh, Walter Pierce was the president. Just so good to me. Vicky yeah. Moffitt, the you know Ali Ash, and I told them I I really wanted to take a chance, take a leap, and try this out. And they were so helpful. I mean, normally people would be like, "Get the heck out of here." <laughs> They gave we me want practice. you out five minutes. Yeah. yeah. You know, Walter Pierce, spe speaking of Walter Pierce, I don't think I said that yet. And not to mix concepts up that we're trying to talk about. Go ahead. And I do like to stay on track. But that is the first person, the president, Walter Pierce, um, ge genius. Um, he's the first person. Our offices are next to each other. I was so afraid being next to his office because I'm kind of, you know, I'll lay down on the floor and sketch and I'll be in a yoga pose or do whatever I want, you know? Right. Walter came in after I made a presentation to him and he's like, I thought he was going to yell at me or I thought he was yelling at me. He's like, you read the copy. Look, at Lori read the copy. She actually read the copy. She didn't just like whatever. And I was like, oh, no, I'm so sorry, Walter. He's like, no, it's like. No one ever reads the copy. <laughs> Just whatever art, they don't have any idea. I think I'd ask him like a thousand questions. Um, it was on a direct mail campaign for one of the publications for financial piece, if I recall. And I'm like, yeah, I don't understand this. Or why is this the offer? Or why are you doing this? Or yeah. I don't know, maybe he wasn't used to people asking him a question, but I needed to know. Right. You know? So that is kind of important to me, is to be hooked up in, in that respect. So Walter and everyone was, you know, they were just lovely. Yeah, I left on Cinco de Mayo, which I think is a great thing <laughs> to jump. And luckily, you know, I'm very blessed. Um, what made you decide to start at that point? Like, did you have a certain, by this date, or what was it that was, because that's not an easy thing to do. What was yeah. pulling you to do yeah. that? Many things. Maybe I was big and fat and pregnant uh, with my third son. That could have been it. And um, I don't know. I think I would think the opposite. I would think I'm pregnant. I want the stability. I'm not gonna. I'm just gonna stay at the job. But you were thinking differently. Yes. Well, if you knew me, you know, if you really, really knew me, I um, I love being a mom. That's like all I wanted to be in my life was just the best mom I could be. Yeah. So I was looking for a way to spend more time with my children yeah. and also catapult my passion for art. So mm -hmm. I think it was a combination. And I'm not saying it was easy at all. I'm very lucky to have a lovely family and support team and wonderful people in this business. But definitely, I wouldn't do it any other way. And I love where I am. And that whole journey was so fulfilling. It's delicious, you know? How'd you get your first few clients? Yeah, that was a lovely writer by the name of Doug Deanna. I, I don't know if you know of him. Expert, mm -hmm. A-list, top-notch writer out in California. And... He was so kind to give out my name. He had written a piece for a boardroom, I think. Um, I'm positive I did just a terrible job on it, perhaps. It was so new, you know, being out like that and felt different or something. Um, but he reached out, 
and gave me a huge chance. Uh, that was the first person. And then probably Paris Slimpropolis, again, you know, top, tippity top writer of the world. Um, he called me one day and I'm like either cooking something for my children or doing a design or both. I can't remember. And he and I tell this story all the time when we're together. I'm answering the phone. I'm like, you know, who is it? I wonder who it is. And he says, hi, this is Paris Lampropolis. And I'm like, okay. And he's like, do you know who I am? And I say, I don't, but you really have an interesting name. <laughs> probably spelled really cool. And he didn't know, but I explained to him and probably bored him to death that um, when I hear somebody's name because I'm so visual, I see all the letters, you know. So it was going L, A, M, you know, again and again and again. So we kind of hit it off, and he had wanted to ask if uh, he had seen some of my pieces or something, and he asked me to do a piece together with him. And again, so kind, so generous. I had no idea so many times what he was talking about, and he would. It was he was probably wanting to hang himself. <laughs> um, he would say, Lori, like this, you know, practically doing it himself um, until I caught on. What was some of the uh, advice he gave you at the time? Yes, it was on a campaign for a boardroom, which I believe did very well for a, a while for Dr. Stengler. He told me many things about the column widths of fonts and how he would like to see it and why. It's very that, precise. Oh, it's lovely. It, it's so giving because instead of giving up on me, he gave to me. He chose to spend the time with me. I'm positive he had better things to do and he didn't know me. He had no reason to give this gift to me, nor did any of these other people and they did. And that sends a message to you, you know, and you want to try really hard and Right. I try so hard to listen and take notes and, you know, so he gave me that and he would work with me and he would try to have his patience with me. I'm sure it was difficult, but as I would show him things, he would tell me maybe larger or bigger like this. Here's an example. And instead of just saying, you know, bigger or whatever, he would tell me why. So because, why was it? Yeah, you know, Paris is the one that... When you're choosing a photo, he told me that the eyes, when you have a person in there, everyone looks to the eyes. And if you test yourself, you know, you do. You can't help yourself. So you can use the positioning or juxtapositioning of the logos and the headlines and the sub subheads and whatnot on the page so that you force the reader to go from one side to the next, for example. Huge. I do it every day, and every day I do that. I see Paris's face and hear his voice telling me. How do you, so that's with following a person's eyes in the picture? Exactly. So how do you do it if you don't have a picture of a person? How do you get them to follow the flow that you want them to? Right. It's very specific, and I speak with the copywriter a lot about this. For example, if I'm doing a mag log and it's eight and a half by 11 and there's two pages together, if perhaps the writer has recommended that there's a headline, obviously that headline needs to hold the top of the page. You know, it needs to be heavy on the top and go down from there. So you have this big, strong, hard hitting headline. And then kind of the level of things in the order of arrangement in which you so choose for them to read or see or react to, you put them either larger, bigger, darker, deeper, you know, you have to force yourself to set the tone and make the reader go from the left. In the United States, we read from the left to the right and top to the bottom and force them to then turn the page. These Magalogs or catalogs, direct mail campaigns, whatever you want to call them. Mm -hmm. They're like a catalog and a maglog. They're like 24 pages. So on the front, you have your headline and your big splash. You, you want them to open it up. So the copywriters made it. So it's this 
cadence, you know, like introducing yourself and dragging them to the back where it's the yeah. platform. So we try to position things to force the reader in that in that respect. Yeah. And Laura, you were talking earlier about some of the, you do a lot of research and you want to see all the successful campaigns and why they worked and then why some didn't work. What were some of the want, successful ones that you remember and why they were effective? See, this, this one that really was a prolific win in my mind in many respects is one that I did with writer Carlene Anglais-Cole. It was for True Health. It was a liver supplement. I cannot remember the supplement name, but that does not matter. So I want to read to you, um, I don't know by heart, I'm going to just read to yeah. you the front headline, main headline for the Magalog. That'd so be great. It's 24 pages. I need to sell these people. Let's set the tone here. They're in their late 40s till their early 70s. They're getting this 24 page, 8.5 by 11 color piece. So Carlene writes, if you could see your overworked liver, here's what it would look like. You know, or here's how it would look. And what she wanted uh, was a picture of a man with a really ugly, like bruised and battered and lumpy and icky looking face because we were trying to portray her, her concept or theme was to portray this hideous liver. Right. that had been affected and the main thing was this is a 20 cent per day supplement you can take um, that will save your life and it fights off the damaging effects of alcohol, prescription drugs and bad eating habits and it's guaranteed to work. So that's what I had to work with. Um, if you could see it, here's how it would look. Yeah. So at first they were trying to force me, this is kind of a couple of things here going on, Right. trying to force me to look on the internet and find an existing shot of a man, an exact man, and then photo retouch using Photoshop. You've probably used it yourself, you know. Do bruises and stuff. And I tried it, obviously, you know, that's the kind of girl I am. I'm a can-do girl, but I'm not milk toast, you know. So I tried it and I'm like, this is so fake. We cannot, we can't have this. I'm serious. This is too good of a headline. It's a great concept. We have to. You need a real, something real. Yeah. You got to let me get my connection since I had done all that work with so many magazines Washingtonian Magazine, Dossier Magazine, all these high level people with photographers and models. That was 20 years, you know, of my life. I, um, called upon the modeling agency in D.C. and said, I need to get somebody from New York, you know, Baltimore or D.C. I need a male actor in this age group that we're speaking to. I kind of need him to have silvery gray but black hair. And I need him to be a really good actor but also a model, you know. So they sent over the head comps, the head sheets, and I picked, you know, down to four or five and I kind of showed Carlene and the client. Then I chose my photographer, and that was simple, Larry Ruggieri, who I had used for 20-some years, again, a uh, local, just killer photographer, knows the ins and outs of lighting. Lighting is the key. Then I hand-picked, again, that's something about my studio here, hand-picking and choosing this makeup artist, and she ordered since I needed these legions and bruises and stuff, it couldn't look fake. It really had to be like, here's your liver. We looked at liver shots of what livers look like when they're diseased and right. damaged. Um, and she ordered these plastic pieces to adhere onto Aaron Marcus. Aaron Marcus was the winner. He was the model actor I chose. He's been in LA Law, tons of things. I'm sure you've seen him. He's got that rubber face. And he's lovely to work with, very, very wonderful person. So she ordered these big legions made of plastic to adhere and then put the makeup on for me over top. What happened was something happened. Obviously, this project is a rush, as usual. As usual, right. As usual. The legions didn't come in time. Can you imagine asking your postal guy, your mailman, 
did you see any legions? <laughs> I'm looking for some legions. So she ended up having to make them the night before with this wax that she melted. And she, you know, adhered them to Aaron's face. But I would say the most critical part of this whole topic about this cover and Carlene's killer headline, that's how it started. Her concept, her thinking, her research, she hit home with this. And then us together as a team. Then Larry Ruggieri, again, hiring the best. I told Larry the idea. I showed him the sketch. And he told me he needs me to get out. You know, he needs me to not say a thing. And he's going to have Aaron's face made up, and I can look at it, but I may not talk with him. I don't know exactly his words, but this is how, you know, of course, he's I'm being like, very. I'm like, I'm the director. I direct every shot. I know how it's, I'm going to direct Aaron. I know Aaron. I've spent time with him, you know. And uh, I had invited Carlene's uh, younger daughter, who's uh, a graphic designer herself, and she had not been on a lot of photo shoots. So she drove down because she wanted to watch this whole thing in process. And uh, she's very helpful, and it was wonderful having her with me. I'm sure she saw me stewing, but. The brilliance of Larry. Why did he not want you there? Okay, I'm going to tell you. Okay. That he didn't. You made me know. turn the page with that yeah, one. I'm yeah, turning the, the page. <laughs> cliffhanger. He didn't tell Aaron what we were doing totally, and nor did I. You know, I just said we're shooting a like a magazine cover, and uh, a little I'm bit. I'm putting back. wax on your face, but. So he made Aaron uh, try on a few tops before, like these gray tops. And I, I wish you could see this. I don't, I don't know if you saw the copy. I did, yeah. What, what he did was he didn't tell anything to Aaron. He just had him make these looks of sadness, despair, depression. He didn't say, Aaron, you have all these legions on your face. He didn't let him look at his face. He didn't know what he looked like. He didn't know it was all bruised. There was red under his eye. And Aaron, with that rubber face and his talent and his acting and modeling, you know, that, sh it, it showed through. He was, you know, like this. And, like, it felt like a diseased liver. And <laughs> he can go, that total black in the background with this blue tint and then all that makeup and just like the side of his face showing, not his whole head, his hair and his ears and his chest. It was brilliant. And that's why these things work. But if you just try to bang it out and you listen to what, you know, the client's like, just choose a photo, you know, slap it on there. I don't know. Not that the client was doing that in this case. Right. Um, yeah, there's a lot of time and attention and detail and coordinating that goes into this. Definitely, but that's what it takes to yeah. sometimes get that killer winner, and it, it ran for quite a long time, and that's mm -hmm. how you do it. Sometimes mm -hmm. you have to go outside the box. Yeah, that was a great story. Thanks for sharing that. Lori, what's another successful campaign that sticks out to you? Let's see. Maybe we'll talk about the one with Donna Doyle. You mentioned her as yeah. well. Yes, yeah, she's a great writer, great energy. Her and I were doing a diet campaign for a huge publisher in, uh, in the East Coast, and it was this prolific doctor. His name was on the diet campaign, diet supplements, diet newsletter, and whatnot. Great copy. I hadn't met Donna, and I didn't know about her yet, but right when Matthew Katz and uh, Jenny Thompson gave me this copy, I'm like, I'm going to meet this person who wrote the copy. I've never seen anything like it. It's driving it home. I'm so intrigued. I want to go on a diet. You know, come on, let me have it. <laughs> so we work on this together. One huge stopping point, um, again, a red flag on my end, and this is where that trusting each other goes, that connection between the copywriter and the designer, trusting what each person has to say, just like in any relationship. I say to the client and the writer, Donna, that once those photos came through to me, talking about Oprah photos, these photos came through to me for this doctor. They were portraying the doctor as this renowned scientist and healthy and eating. And no offense, obviously, to the doctor or 
the uh, product or the client, but just the fo photos and the way taken of this doctor positioned his body and his neck and everything in, just in an incorrect way. Um, I just couldn't have, how can somebody look at this doctor who doesn't look healthy at all and base this whole product and right. launch on this look? So I asked them, and I think this was the first time, this was a million years ago, uh, right when you know you were really getting down and dirty with computers and Photoshop, I asked them permission, and uh, I don't know if the doctor knows this. Well, I'll say it anyway. I didn't say the doctor's name. I asked them permission to chop the doctor's head off and alter his head a little in the position of it and add it to a different body and, you know, position, juxtaposition of his body. Um, in the shot and create a whole new shot so he looked robust and vibrant and healthy and yeah. like you do want to listen to him and buy this newsletter and we were very lucky I mean obviously it was the copy and Matthew Katz I mean he told me let's not do too many crazy photos let's not let's keep it more of a newsletter this was probably one of the first newsletter looks rather than splashy huge photos that I had ever done and this one, you know, for quite a long time, and I believe the statistics that came back were 200% return. Wow, that's amazing. Yes. And that's, Good thing you chopped his head off. Yeah, I'm sure it's because I chopped the head off. <laughs> so after a while, you know, they would tease me that, uh, gosh, it's probably really bloody in the studio. You know, you're making all these appendages and cutting them off. So uh, we had fun with that. It's a great group to work with. But yes, that was a fun, fun project. So, Lori, what were some of the ones that you, when you were doing your research, that didn't work, and why? Well, you don't want to talk about that part, right? Right. Yes, yeah, some of them, um, some of them, most of them stem from doing all the research and presenting it and showing the comps and whatnot, and then having the team... For example, the client, and this is no offense to these clients. This is all they had, you know, to draw from within, I'm sure. Having them decide to just go with something that maybe the accountant in the office came up with or yeah. wife came up with or something. They weren't going with the research. They weren't listening or hearing the data. I am not lying to you if you don't listen and look and research and do all that dirty leg work you know who cares what you design and write if you don't pick the right format pick the right mailing list all of it matters um, you can just get something that just bombs you know you can get like negative response so there have been a few of those luckily you know in the last 15 years I've you know, got my cojones together and I'm like, hey! It's know? hard. If, you know, a client's paying you. You know, you give them what you have, but you can't force it down their throat to an extent, right? You cannot. You can't do that with anybody. But I think now the tone I use with them, it does matter. I say, you know, I am serious about this and... Maybe there's been one or two times where I've had to push away from the table and say, no, thank you. I just, uh, this is scaring me. And I feel like, yes, that's exactly it, Jeremy. I've said, no, thank you very much. I'm just so blessed and thankful that you called me. But you're setting me and you up for a fail, fail. There's no winning. I can always, you know, like already see the end. I, I cannot do this and, um, and and walk away. And please call me again. I'd love to work with you, but this is making my stomach hurt and I have a red flag. And what did they say? At that point, do they ever turn, turn around and say, okay? Most of the time they do. Recently, with a huge copywriter, and I'm not going to go into any specifics. Yeah, you don't have to name names, okay. of course, yeah. But... Uh, again and again and again through the whole process it was you know here's the three 
new looks. You need a human. You need a person in this. You're so sterile. No one's going to buy this. That's why your sales are dropping. The copy was eloquent. I've worked with this person for 20 years. Um, just a pleasure. Again and again, you know, here's the things, here's the reasoning. Nope, you know, we're going to do it the old way. Um, no, we're changing the copy. No, we're going to the old, old, old way. Again and again. And we just stuck in there. We kept trying to raise our hands. Um, I, yeah. I I feel like hindsight, I should have yelled a little louder this time. Um, really angry with myself. This was recent over the last like three or four months. And I won't let that happen again. I'm going to stand up for myself more, no matter yeah. who it is that's the client, no matter how big they are or how I want to work with them so much, I need to remember. Yeah. yeah. It's your reputation and you get blamed in the end, even if they don't choose what you did, probably. That's exactly, that's exactly what happens. And so this was kind of a lose-lose and I should have probably spoke up a little more and said, Listen, you can keep going to the right, and I'm telling you to go to the left, but I just want you to know that, you know, I don't want you to, and that's why I've come yeah. up with this new idea, and you can't, and that's why you're not getting the response you need. And, um, but, so, but you need, you know, I'm always a professional. I'm always very kind and polite. Of course. I'm not here to hurt anyone's feelings. I definitely get that sense. Yes, that, yes of course. But I can be very firm. <laughs> In a nice way. In a nice way. Um, what's a question, Lori, that's important to address about design and layout with direct response that's really important but often gets overlooked? Is there anything like that? Yeah, a lot of times people overlook like who it is that they're selling to and why. Mm -hmm. And I know for a fact, since I was on the other side of the fence and in the big company working, that you're pressured, you're overworked. There's too many things to do and too few people. Mm -hmm. So what happens is, you know, they're rushing. They don't mean to, and that's no offense to them. So someone like myself and the copywriter come in and we're fresh and we're open. And all we're doing is that's every job I take. I only focus on that job when I'm doing that job. It's number one. I don't care if it's like a $25 business card right. or a million dollar campaign. That is number one right now when I'm thinking of it. So we're on the outside. We're the people that are calling in. We're so fresh. We have not been in those 500 meetings and those phone calls and we're not pissed off either. You know? Yeah. So I think us focusing and doing that research is so critical, even more critical than that photo I choose in the end or maybe that font almost. But sometimes I've had it happen where when I'm reading the copy that second and third time like I explained to you earlier, I found with a very big company about three years ago, I was reading the copy again like that. I, I was embarrassed to tell them but I did. In the end, I couldn't ever find the offer. I didn't understand what their offer That's a problem, right? I couldn't understand what they were trying to tell me or sell me. or It was so confusing. There's this library, that library, whatever. What the heck is a... Why do I want that? So it took me a good day to get myself enough strength. There was huge people I was working with. And right. I'm the artist. You know, come on. So... I told them in a certain way with a very few words that I was not understanding and I apologized. Could they please explain it to me so I could understand it because without me understanding it, if it's... You can't do your creative job if you don't yeah. understand what they're, what they're offering. Or even any part of it, you can't do your job properly. Right. So their email back, it was, it was many hours and I was like, Oh, they're going to tell me to go home. <laughs> so I guess they had to call a meeting. What had happened was they had went through so many reiterations and somebody accidentally, you know how this happens with Word files and stuff. It's so persnickety. A big chunk of copy that somebody was supposed to edit or whatever, it just escaped the file. I mean, it happens. And somebody was, you know, in a rush. They sent it over. Come on, Lori, hurry up. We're on a deadline, whatever. And, um... 
everybody was just proofreading that, you know, they weren't me. They weren't me being the man that needs the financial retirement plan. That's what kind of it was for. Right. And I'm pretending I'm a man. I need to save for my retirement. How much is this going to cost me? I don't see the offer. I don't get what the libraries are they're talking about and how much does it cost. Couldn't find it. Couldn't figure it out. And, you know, what if we would have went out with it? Right. Millions of copies. So that's crazy. Well, but you can see how it happens. Yeah. You know, it's so, good to be on the outside, right? Yes. It gives a different perspective. And you were talking, Lori, about, you know, about crafting the layout, the eye direction. You lead with the eye and uh, the headline. Are there certain things you use with color or fonts that sh people should know about? Yeah, for the color and fonts, again, I drive it home with the brand. The brand is so critical. Mm -hmm. So if I were to pick this really frilly font and it was for men with back aches or whatever, they wouldn't want to read that. Um, as well as men who, or women, who are looking for a person to invest their $500,000 nest egg. Right. Do they want to see frivolous, big, huge, fancy? No, that's for me or to show to my mom. No. They want something that looks like a very valuable report, looks like it came from a bank. So fonts and colors, if I were to present orange and pink, something crazy that I want to see, to this age group, you know, 40 to 70 men, they're, they don't care. Nor can I over design it. A lot of my designs are so dang ugly, I'm not even going to show them to you. They sell like hotcakes. Ugly works, and I can do good ugly, let me tell you. That's, <laughs> That's a good term, good ugly. So, what would be a backache font? Backache font. I would probably try like a Helvetica. Like I can't even name, I'm sure you have the stuff off the top of your head. I couldn't even name more I'll than two. I'll explain to you. You will know. You will know the sans serif font. Sans serif means just a block, you know, straight. You see this all the time mm -hmm. on the computer, Helvetica, Arial, that type. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The serif, those are more um, easy to read. Uh, they're like Times Roman. You've used that, Times New Roman mm -hmm. word. Uh, Garamond, Palatino, they have those little feet. So those little feet and those little beautiful W's and G's and A's, those make your reader's eye go from point A to point B and back and again. And so a backache for a headline, I might need something big and strong, probably pain is involved, extra bold Helvetica headline font, mm -hmm. and then some easy to read font for the running body copy, and then like that. So I study fonts all the time and they're so critical. Lori, I want to hear about, uh, I know you've had a lot of success in your career, a painful moment, a low point. Hmm. That's tricky to talk about. Let's see. So probably the lowest point. Yeah was getting a contract with a, a company that I'd, I'd wanted to work with for like a million years. And maybe uh, I had done a couple things with them, but um, a couple things were happening in my life that were just very tricky. And it made it so I couldn't do all these things I'm talking about. And I didn't know how to tell them because I didn't know them that well. You mean there were other circumstances going on that didn't allow you to to give your full, what you normally, the Lori effort type of thing? Probably 3% of me. Wow. It was bad. It was huge. It was a huge, huge turning point in many things in my life. Mm -hmm. Critical, badness. And... Uh, I'm, if you're saying that, it must have been really bad because you seem like the most optimistic, happy person. So, Very bad. Yeah. I, to this day, have not shared it with that client. They have not called me back. We have good rapport, which is great. I will never tell them. 
and I just had to slump away. <laughs> you know, it took me down. It took me way, probably one of the farthest points of downness. Yeah, you can probably hear it in my voice. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so that was bad. So I had to shake myself. I had to get past that big clump and, um, and, and move forward and shake myself off and, and try again. And yeah. I tried never now to let something such as that on the outside, you know, meddle with the passion and the openness and the calmness. That's why I have a variety of certain people now in my life, mm -hmm. um, and they they help me do that. They know, and they help me do that, which is great. Yeah, and I, you know, we all hit those low points, and it's tough to turn around. How did you then turn around from that that low point? Well, you know, I still needed to eat and feed myself and my family, so I still had to keep going and looking for work, and I just told myself that this was not within my control. It was not, and this is not me and not how I would have done things. I didn't want it to go that way, and I didn't want that project to go that way. I didn't want to do that to that client. And I was at the lowest low. And if I would have probably just told them, but I was embarrassed, you know. Yeah. Um, I'm positive now, you know, years later. Um, they would have been like, oh, my God. You need to stop, you know, try to take care of this. And um, we're, we're so sorry for you. That That's how they are. I know them. Right. I couldn't, and I can't, and I won't ever. Yeah. 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 I mean, obviously, whatever it is, it was, I'm sure it was very personal, so you don't want to necessarily share it, but sharing it would kind of open that communication and everyone would understand type of thing. Yeah. But that is a hard thing to, to do. Exactly. So yeah. uh, in lieu of all that, I can say that then just moving forward and telling myself, um, Getting on a positive note, Lori, that wasn't anything to do with you. You had totally uncontrol of that. Too bad you didn't know better to just say, these are wonderful people. You know, this mm -hmm. is what's happening. It's too embarrassed. It was too horrible and embarrassing. So I just moved on, and um, I have solved that situation. And uh, I will never, I will always, like, if, that, if something came up again, now I'd be like, you know what? Other people have things going on in their life that are huge and bad and critical. Mm -hmm. And I would have raised my hand and said, you know me. You know my work. You know this is not me. This is not my work. Please, mm -hmm. I, I need to not do this project. And, uh, yeah, so, yay, moving forward. Yay, me, you know. Yeah. So on, the, on that end of it, Lori, yeah. what's been a proud accomplishment? Something that you're amazed that you did? Yeah. What's one of the big milestones of your career that you look at and think, wow, that was me who did that? That would probably be for this uh, financial client I have. And it's, it's an account that is held like on my own with other people, but it's not held by a company. So there's directors and stuff. It's just me and just them. And it's just my knowledge and them. So over the last 15 years, we've worked very closely together, very successfully, and um, I set it up so that we could meet each other in person. We hadn't met each other in person, and luckily it's only an hour or so away from my studio. So I met with the marketing person that does the list and the client and uh, myself. And so we had our meeting and everything. But again, I needed a new big control. I needed to know more about this person. All these years, it was just like kind of flatline, and we were getting huge responses, but I wanted to kick it up a notch. So I, I used that Colombo thing I was talking about where I'm like, yeah, one more question. So I hope it's okay I say this, so I'm not saying any names. So I asked this client, I'm at their house, and they tell me that they have 
all the history of mailings, even before they knew me, for a million years in their basement and all these things. And I'm like, you know, like this. Ooh, that sounds delicious. So <laughs> I asked, come on, let me go down. You know, you don't know me, but you probably know me by now. I'm going to say it. I don't care. I need a big control, you know, give it to me. So I asked them if we could just spend a while down in their basement and I could snoop around, you know, and they were probably like calling the police or <laughs> lady wants to come to my basement. So in any case, a really cool thing was I was able to ask uh, using that list that I told you earlier about you want to see what won, what lost, let me see it, who was it for, why, why did you mail it, when did you mail it. And so we found a lot of papers and then I found these old, old samples and the client was like really embarrassed. Um, oh my gosh, I did that on my computer, it's so ugly, I did it myself in Quark. You know, it was this really odd, god-awful color, and it was hideous. I mean, you know, hideous, good hideous. I mean, he did a great job. I was proud of him. And I'm like, let me see the numbers on that. You know, he's like, oh, I don't, I don't know. I don't know if it did good. It was so ugly. I just decided not to mail it again. I'm like, you know, red lights are going off. Woo, woo, that's what happens to me. So we looked at the numbers, and it was a huge winner when he mailed it. So this is looking like 10 years back, I think. I could be lying, but it wasn't like it was last month. You know, I'd been Right, it was a while. So I asked him to pull it up on his computer and maybe freshen it up and put in some of the copy that we knew was winning. And we went out with it. And I don't think we did it as a control. We had been mailing. It was like a Magalog, I'll just say that. And like 24 pages, this god awful color, I'm not going to say, because then you'll see it in the mail. Got awful look, and it went crazy. This was like two years ago. Um, so that became our control. Can you say what type of product, what, what genre was it? Was it a health product? Financial. Words not working anymore, perhaps retirement. Okay. Like that. Wink, wink. Yeah. <laughs> so that type of product. So again, look, we're going right to the core again, this unique specificity that, you know, Brian Kurtz talks about, you know, all the people at all the top companies that you work with, all these copywriters, yeah. we're trying to hit home, like, this client had this edge about his knowledge, it was him they wanted to hear from, right. this was his voice, and this gave him a vehicle to show it to them, just mm -hmm. like he was producing it in mm -hmm. his basement, so I kept that look. I didn't fancy it up. I, you know, the illustrations were probably very, they were, they were really raw. He had just found them himself. And we tried it. And the reason I'm explaining this story to you is that's probably the first time that it was just me and just them. And it was just my idea and gut and all these 30 some years, you know. Right. these years you know and me trusting myself enough to say it instead of you know like I don't know an idea I don't, you know and then them you know me being able to portray that feeling to them and them to be able to trust me it was a lot of trust yeah. he had taken me and us trying it together and um, it's not even fatiguing yet but already we have a brand new idea. We just had our uh, meeting and I, you know, we came up with a grand new idea to twist and I'm positive it's gonna work out. So the twist is to beat that, that one that was running. Exactly, in a nutshell. So you're mailing something, say you're mailing 250,000. Um, gosh, I'm gonna try a little test to mail against it just to see so I'll order like 25,000 of a unique test. You know, not too far from it, but far enough so I can really get a good grasp on it. Right. Numbers are my thing. That's kind of odd for an artist, but uh, I'm a businessman first. Well, it's, you know, it's direct response design, it, right? You, so. Yeah, you're absolutely right. So those numbers are so critical. So I'll go out with that 200,000 of the one that's, you know, bringing in the bacon and then try this 25,000 and boy if I see whoo this is 
really winning. Obviously, that is what we call, that's our new control or the winner. And then we'll mail, you know, 200,000 of that and test something else again and again. Yeah. And uh, it's really... So it's, can you talk about what the twist is or is that just too new to... Uh, yep, to no. Reveal? <laughs> I, I obviously have to ask that. So. I know. You wanted to turn the page and get your wallet out. I can't wait to have season one, right? Oh, it will, uh, it's going to involve a uh, format, though. I will say that. And what that means is instead of it being just a Magalog, it'll be a different shape. Okay. So stay tuned for that. I will have to piece and through every piece of mail I get and look for it. I can tell. Lori, we talked about a lot of, of great things. What's one last great piece of advice you can leave with the audience? Advice about direct mail? How about, yeah, design. If someone is thinking about design in the, the right. direct mail, what, what do you advise them? I mean, you've given a lot of, of great stuff. What should they make sure they don't leave out or they do leave out? Yeah, I would say like three key tips would be to really do your homework. Yeah. It's going to show if you don't to everyone and the bottom line. The bottom line is what we're going for there, so don't scrimp on that. And really read the copy and know it. And then this whole thing about kind of loving yourself and being true to yourself you need to take all that about yourself and feel confident enough to really thrust whatever you're doing forward in a big way and know, like some of these stories that we've talked about together today, know when to say no. You know, that just doesn't add up to working and when to say yes and really hold your ground. You know, stand up for yourself. Use your knowledge and just never stop trying and uh, and kind of learning and growing. That's that that would probably be in a nutshell. Yeah, and then you mentioned um, or you, you wrote down the breast cancer special setup. What is that? Yes, that's that in a nutshell is a big part about me and who I am and about things that go on in the studio and what I tell people and that is um, whether it's the breast cancer flyer and postcard that I'm working on from the second you and I stopped talking till all weekend for free I'm doing it for free because I want to you know because you believe in that cause what you're saying I believe in that cause mm -hmm. I believe that perhaps if I can do this crazily enormous campaign that's winning that I can perhaps give something to a woman so that she can get a scan or something and keep herself healthy. Mm -hmm. I love giving back. Mm -hmm. I do stuff like that all the time in my studio uh, for the Mental Health Association. You know, people that you know have mental health problems and issues, can't yeah. get a job, can't feed their children. And uh, recently with Michael and Mark and Kathy Ford on their foundation in Nicaragua, Fun Limon, I'm donating all my time since December or January pretty, you know, seriously on a website launch to collect donations to help educate and feed hmm. these children. So That's getting great. back to the breast cancer one, yeah. obviously these women are saying, Susie Bell Towery, again, A-list copywriter. She's donating her time. You, Lori, just bang it out. You know, just anything. Just quick. I don't care. No, I'm going to make, you mm. know, the best campaign I can. Because, yeah. it, you know, it matters to me. Right. I Lori, what's the toughest part about being a designer, direct response designer? Uh, maybe not enough sleep. No, the toughest part is just um, probably that that research. Is that the angle in which you're asking the the? I don't know. 
much. I don't even know what the answer would be. I'm just curious. See, the toughest part. Yeah, probably for me, just because the kind of person I am, I'm a giver. I like to give. Sometimes I probably need to give maybe a hair less, uh, maybe not, but I just want to keep researching, I see. figuring it out, growing, yeah. and probably that's not a bad Instead thing. Instead of doing like 10 focus groups, you could do nine focus groups or something. Yeah, <laughs> maybe. That's, that's exactly it. But uh, needing to corral things a yeah. little um, but definitely yeah. watching that angle. Yeah. Lori, so I have one last question for you. I really appreciate your time. It's super valuable. It's Before I ask it, I wanted to hear what's exciting now. Tell people about your, where can they find you online? What's going on with you? So for me, lots of fun things going on in the studio. Yeah, Shadow Oak Studio. So where can yeah. they find you first? Shadow Oak Studio, you just go to www.shadowoakstudio.com and you'll see my website there. I give a list of uh, some of my clients that I can actually share their names with you. And just a touch, you know, I don't know if you and I talked about that, but uh, I sign, obviously, as you all do uh, and the copywriters do, a lot of legal NDA non disclosure agreements. Right. On my website, you will notice. Four examples and only little snippets. The portfolio. And obviously, I cannot disclose um, yeah. most of the pieces. But once you make an appointment with me, obviously, I'll share those with you. What's going on right now in our studio? We are creating a brand, a brand new brand for a prominent doctor that has tons, I would say, a plethora of supplements, books, products, newsletters, e-letters, e e-zines, such as that. Um, and we're creating those with a new twist and we're testing some landing pages and we just got the email this morning that the big presentation that we made yesterday or the day before was a smashing success and they're very pleased. So that, numero uno, when I got up today, uh, that along with knowing about this call, um, that made me That's smile. Great. I'm Foon Limon. I told you about the Nicaraguan project. That is so dear to my heart because yeah. I see myself helping people eat, you know, children, being educated, mothers finding a way to get a home. That I cannot be more happy about. And then a couple other huge branding projects. I tend to do a lot of branding and serious consulting with that and then it rolls into the direct mail campaign for the product or the service for example so really busy in the in the studio I'm always very blessed to have so much work and um, so do you have to do design on the website people's websites too like when you when they're launching these landing pages and and uh, websites are you having yes. to do a lot of that as well I do the design and I'm the creative director behind those but Fortunately, my company has grown, you know, large enough. So I have a whole team that works directly with me. We have designers and then implementers, the people that do the HTML, as you know, some of the social media, and yeah. actually uh, create some of the mainframes. We have developed through uh, this other team, uh, Exceed CMS software platform that aids a lot of my clients these days with um, you know, culminating some of the needs that they had. Right. And so, yes, we do. It's a full service studio. And I don't know if we talked about that, but um, you know, true to my heart, obviously, is direct mail. But yes, we do. We've had to combine yeah. web with the direct mail because there's such a unique marriage now. Yeah. So, Lori, my last question is putting you on the spot a little bit, but um, I want to hear some of your all-time favorite copywriters. Wow. Well, you know, this won't be in any order, okay? Okay. This like, well, the first one will. Okay, I'll say the first one's obviously Gary Bensavinga, and I say that just so deeply. And then the rest of them, 
Let's see. Gosh, I've been so blessed to to be positioned with so many copywriters. I will just go down the line. Does that sound good? Yeah, it sounds good. Yeah. All right. How about this? Paris Lampropolis, David Deutsch, Bob Bly, Arlene Anglais Cole, Kim Schwamm, Donna Doyle, Lloyd Fur, Thomas Callahan. Those are just a few. There's so many, and they each are so unique in how they bring the copy to life. But I I really want you to hear it. I hope you can in my voice how I just feel so lucky to have worked and learned with all these people for all these years and yeah. what they've given to me. Yeah. Well, Lori, I want to be the first one to thank you. This has been amazing, very valuable, and just thank you so much for, for sharing your valuable insights with us. Well, Jeremy, thanks for having me. I had a blast, and I really enjoyed meeting you in person. Thanks a lot. Likewise. Thank you.